covering us, protecting us, keeping us. Father, we come tonight because our heart desire is we desire to be disciples of Christ, to know you better, to open up the truth of your word in a world of confusion. We seek to be your disciples and to know you and to know you better. How can we do that? Except that the Holy Spirit of God make known truth to us. Father, I pray tonight will be a night that truth will be made known to us and we will be able to take the truth that we learn and are exposed to tonight and apply it to our lives and our lives will be better for you. I pray your blessings upon all those who have joined, those who will view this later on. I pray, Lord, that this teaching moment will be a moment by which lives will be captivated and touched for your glory. Let us make the most of this moment. Let it not be in vain. We will give you the praise, the glory, and the honor which is yours. Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. Join us in a song or two. We're going to worship the Lord together. Hallelujah. I love to pray.
you like me, you've been there, done that, tried some of everything, and you know, without a shadow of a doubt, there is none like him. No one can be compared to the Lord. Well, we're doing our study in the book of John, and we're hoping to finish John chapter 6 today. We're going to touch base on where we were last week, and we're going to kind of run a little bit and then slow down to get to where we were, but I just want to recap on what we uh, learned and where we're at in John chapter 6. Uh, the feeding of the 5,000 is one of the miracles that all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all wrote about. All of them gave a different kind of angle about it, but they all gave the account of the miracle. And there's some details that different ones talked about. Uh, in one of the other Gospels, other than John, they talk about how Jesus is moved with compassion and heals, and uh, they saw the miracles which he did. And because of that, they came clinging to Jesus. Many of people were clinging to Jesus. Because of that, this crowd has been drawn out from their homes, their cities, some a considerable long uh, uh, distance from their home, and uh, the Lord is compassionate to the natural need in man. We've often said in our circle uh, that you don't try to minister to a hungry soul, uh, a natural hungry. You feed that person. Uh, the man's hungry. Uh, we, we feed him. Jesus met the need. He met the need naturally and fed 5,000 men. What a miracle. You give them all the life, that's 10,000. Give them a couple kids. Now you got a lot of people who are eating. They're being filled. There's 12 baskets left. They really follow Jesus. Now, two things uh, are, are just uh, prominent. He's healed the sick. They witnessed that. Now he's fed them naturally. They're hanging around and not going to leave. They're following Jesus for a considerable uh, length of time and going the distance in following him. One thing that's interesting in this, though, is the reason by which they're following him. In the early uh, John 6, uh, it's not on the screen, but in, uh, on, in verse 1, uh, I just want to open reading that. The Bible says, And after these things, Jesus went over the sea of Galilee, which is by the Sea of Tiberia, and a great multitude followed him, because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. That opened the door for him to feed him of the 5,000, and giving them bread uh, and fish, and they had a wonderful meal, uh, first seafood buffet we know of, and nobody was turned down, and they all began to follow Jesus. But Jesus began to give them a spiritual understanding based on a natural need that they can relate to. But he wanted them to understand spiritual hunger and how spiritual hunger is to be dealt with. We started talking about eating his flesh, drinking his blood, uh, said he's given his uh, flesh, uh, whosoever eats his flesh, drinketh his blood, shall have eternal life. And we pick it up in John 6 and verse 16. And after he's telling them this, they said, this is hard. This is a hard saying, who can hear it? Now, I don't know about you, I've been in the church all my life, just about in and around the church. I've met people who had small congregations, uh, churches, and they said the reason why people won't come because it's too hard. Their way is too prescribed and hard. I've heard that before. I've heard people say it's too hard for them. They don't want to adhere to a strenuous gospel in the way they present the gospel. Well, Jesus is not meaning hard in this sense, but they are looking at this as a hard saying because in the natural, they don't understand what Jesus is saying spiritually. So here they are. Many of them of the disciples, when they heard this, said this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Who can hear it? When Jesus knew it himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them of this opinion. The word hard there in Greek is a word sakaros, which really means hard. It's on the screen there. Sakaros, it means hard, rough, 
very hard to deal with. Uh, six hours, I don't know if I'm saying that right, I'm butchering the problem, but it literally means hard, it means tough. Uh, uh, not hard in the sense that it can't be understood, but it is challenging to understand. So what's happening is that they are saying this is hard, and he says, are you offended? Well, we know from uh, reading our scripture, many of the things Jesus said they were offended by. Uh, was it really hard to understand or hard to adapt to? In 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 16, uh, we see that uh, 2 Peter 3, 16 and 18, the Bible says also in his all epistles, and Peter is talking about Paul, uh, that in which some things are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable wrestle with. Now, we talked about this briefly last week, about being unlearned and unstable and how devastatingly dangerous that is, and yet our church is suffering because of unlearned and unstable people. We've been called to discipleship. Let me say this real quickly, we're going to run. The whole tenor of this whole uh, 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 lesson here in John 6, the Lord seems to be purposely allowing the people who have congregated themselves around him to come face to face with a hard truth as, as to almost see who's willing to go that hard distance or deal with uh, what he's saying in an acceptable manner. Uh, the Lord proposes it to him in such a way that it is seemingly hard. It's almost like he's driving or thinning the church out. He's really proposing to them what would challenge them. It would either drive them or push them away. And for many of them, it was hard. It was tough for them. And there are many things in Scripture that are tough. Peter talking about Paul, who was so diverse and dealt with so many subjects. He said that uh, some of these things are hard to be understood. He didn't say they couldn't be. Because it's hard does not mean it can't be. I have one son who loves a challenge. Uh, you give him something hard to do, and he's going to figure it out. I mean, it might take him a day or two or whatever. He's going to wrap his brain. I've had to try to stop and say, man, don't, don't worry about it no more. And that's just not enough to him because he loves a challenge. He loves to fight, figure a way how to do something that seems impossible. Uh, he talks about unlearned and unstable wrestling with certain things they're trying to understand. In verse 17 and 18, Paul said, Peter said, He therefore, beloved, see how you know these things. Beware lest ye also. Now, here's a passionate warning to them. Because they too, if not left to learn and grow, will be led astray and fall from their own stability, their steadfastness. So he says in verse 18, grow. We cannot emphasize this enough. Grow. And this is the thing people seem to shine from. And the whole idea of the Christian life is that we grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God. The Lord said himself one uh, of the passage. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. If you ask people what they're learning here lately, some of them get offended that you would even ask them that because they haven't learned nothing and don't want to answer the fact that they have not learned anything. But we're called to learn and grow. We think discipleship is some class you get into that's more elite group of people that, that come into the church when really every believer that come in to faith in Christ are called to discipleship. And the tragic thing is we think discipleship is some separate class that people choose to get into. Jesus said you go and you make disciples. You don't ask them to do that. Well, if you know when you come to Christ, you are to become a disciple of Christ, a person who will learn and grow. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when you begin to grow, you become stable and steadfast, unmovable. Jesus, Jesus often said some hard things. 
He often said some hard things. We need our spiritual understanding in, in 2020. That's, that's critical. We need that spiritual understanding. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 15, Jesus says to them, uh, well, in John 6, 62, uh, uh, he said, you'll see the Son of Man where he was before. It is the spirit that quickeneth in the flesh, prophets live. And then he said, the words that I speak are spiritual and they are life. So you can't take the natural and try to understand spiritual from a natural standpoint. And this is why many people, they, they, they plunder and some even fall by the wayside because they're never going to understand spiritual truth from a natural standpoint. The natural man receive not the things of the spirit. Uh, 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 they're foolish sometimes. They need to carry on because they are spiritually deserved. And this is why our reliance is on Christ and him alone. That's why uh, the Holy Spirit is critical in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, uh, chapter 3. Paul says that we're sufficient of ourselves, not that we are, to think anything as of ourselves, our sufficiency is of God, who hath made us, look at this, made, that making process, able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter. And head knowledge, I talk about this all the time, head knowledge is nothing more than that. Head knowledge. And a lot of people got stuff in their head they never made to their heart. Sounds kind of harsh, but it's true. Our church is inundated with many people that got Head knowledge. I mean, I've seen people can finish verses before I can even get them out. They can quote so much scripture and know Bible when they've attended Sunday school and been to camp and Lord knows whatever class and seminar, but yet it never reached their heart. And what truth is good that never gets to your heart? Explain that to me. What truth can benefit you in value of significance that never makes it to your heart? Our church is called Heart to Heart Ministries. Touching hearts, changing lives, because I feel personally, as God gave me that, that if nothing happened in the heart, nothing will change anywhere else. Just recently in this city, they made a fuss about moving some statues, and another uh, pastor in this town made a statement, and I thoroughly agree with him. Moving a statue ain't gonna change nothing. You gotta change the heart of a man. If the heart of a man or woman is never changed, Moving an object doesn't do nothing but just take it strategically from one place to another. But what it represents and what it entails is that people's hearts need to be changed. And a monument, uh, a monument can be a very great reminder of where our hearts used to be at one time. And I always thought, you know, having a monument, it just means historically something took place during a specific time as that monument sat there. And the monument is great. Jacob uh, had a monument. He left the pillar there as a reminder. He had a lip. That was a memorial. A lip. He walked with God. God touched him. He said he made us able ministers of the word for the letter killing. Jesus warns the scribes and the Pharisees in John chapter 6 and verse 64. He said, there's some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. Now, he knew everyone that was exposed to truth. Everyone was exposed to the same truth, but he knew who would believe and who would not believe. I was touched one more time by a comment that was made as I was doing a study before our Bible study started tonight. And a uh, person made a comment about uh, those who would be saved being predestinated before time, that God would not open a man's heart who he's not determined is going to be saved. And I would agree with that. I believe the gospel is being hurled so that every man, woman, boy, and girl can have an opportunity to open their heart to the truth of the gospel and allow Christ to come in. I just don't believe that the Lord has said, all right, you're going to be saved, you're going to be saved, you're not going to be saved, so I'm not going to open up your heart. Uh, they took the passage that said, no man can come except the Father draw him. And they said, God's not going to waste the time to draw somebody. He hasn't determined not going to be saved. And I just can't accept that. 
Because God reaches into hardened hearts with the hammer of the gospel and opens and penetrates that heart. He opens that heart that is resisted. I was one of those that was resisted. Wasn't always open to the gospel. The hammer fell. Thank God it did. Thank God for those that were faithful to swing that spiritual hammer and let the truth of that word pound into my heart and soften up those hard places. Is that not what Ezekiel talked about? So, I believe that there are some who the gospel is going to reach and open their hearts and they're going to understand and grow. And he said, in verse 65, I say to you, no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my promise. That does not mean that there are people God has already determined he's not going to allow to be saved and some that he's going to allow to there's too many scriptures that contradict that point. One of the most passionate verses in the Bible we all quote is John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever, does that leave anybody out? That don't leave anybody out. Doesn't, that doesn't leave a denomination of people, a, a, a nationality or whatever. That does not leave anyone. Whosoever. And this is why Jesus commanded them in the commission to take the gospel into the world. Now what I do believe is that the Lord is not surprised by those who open their heart to the hearing of the gospel and receive him. I believe it does not catch God by surprise at those who would refuse him. I believe God in his sovereignty knows who's going to hear the gospel and that's why at that appropriate time that message comes to them whether it's on a radio, on a tape, or a live, whatever, that message gets to them, and he knows that day and that hour that you would respond in faith to that message and allow him to come into your heart. And I believe you couldn't do that unless God opened your heart to it. Yes. What I don't believe is that God has already blocked some from being saved. And there is some doctrine out there Amen. that believes that. I just don't agree with I just don't agree. He said, there's some of you that don't believe that no man can come except the Father. So here's the dilemma. After this happens, many of them stop following him in verse 66 of John 6. From that time, many of the disciples went back and walked no more. Wow. They walked no more with him. How you like your church to get reduced that quick? You dropping hard truth on them? You preaching the gospel? And the truth will do that now. The truth will thin out of church. And it'll thin out of church. Now, some people come and they're excited and they love the things that are going on. You know, you got your version of the fish and the bread, you know. They come enjoying the good stuff. And once you start telling them, hey, you know, God don't want you shacking up. Uh, this is against God's word. Uh, all of this lifestyle that's, that's contrary, God expects you to uh, take on his identity and with that comes a, a restraint in a sense that, that, that limits you. You can't do it. You're not your own. You're one with Christ. Once people start figuring that out, once the reality of that truth starts zooming in on them, some get very difficult. Some change their mind about walking. You know, this church thing, I've heard it. No, some will just drop off on you. You want to thin out a crowd? You preach the gospel. You go, I, I tell you what, take an assignment. If you were to go in some of these churches where big crowds are, you notice the message never gets deep and personal. It never really zeroes in on the things that will challenge the comforts of people. You start challenging their comfort zone, the things they love, and, and the immorality that might be hidden within a, a church. And I'm not saying because there's a big crowd that's prevalent. Uh, uh, some people come to church and they've never really accepted the call of Christ as a disciple. And when they do become that they are coming face to face with that requirement, Jesus many a times had people walk away from him. Remember that man came and said, uh, I've done all this for my youth and then the Lord found that one spot. And he walked away sad because he had a lot of riches. He couldn't part with them. 
Many other times he said things that thin a crowd out. A crowd, a whole mob brought a woman to Jesus, wanted to stone her. You know the story. And Jesus just simply ignored them. They should have let that be enough, but it wasn't. They pressed the issue and then he said, look, those of you who are without sin, you cast the first stone. What no stone threw was it. And there's some scholars that say when Jesus bent down and right on the ground, he was literally writing the names of those who had, was in error and making their sin. We don't know that exactly, but we know there were convicting words that touched them and they were not comfortable to throw a rock because they own sin and the weight of it and fell in on them. It is tragic when people stop following and don't want to walk no more with him. Like I said before, I've had people leave our church, and uh, you know, it's hard. I, I, I don't like to see people go, but sometimes things happen, people grow, uh, but they went on to other churches. <laughs> now, those that left and didn't go to church no more and left because they didn't like something that was said from Scripture, those that left because they didn't want to bring their lifestyle uh, to certain levels and they didn't want to accept the truth of God now, you know, and they didn't go to another church. They just went on back to the cesspool of sin and enjoyed their lifestyle as they, they like it because they did never want to change. We love people. I don't jump on folks. The word of God will find you out. It'll reach you. And there are many people that have come to our congregation. We love everybody. I accept anybody. You can come. I will minister to you, love on you. But if you're in sin, I don't care what church you go to, somewhere the truth of God will bring you front and center with the truth of God and challenge that particular area in your life. If you're going to be on the truth, it will challenge you. In Zephaniah 1 and 6, uh, uh, well, that word walk is critical. In Zephaniah 1 and 6, Let's look there. The Bible said, and, and them that are turned back from the Lord and those that have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. Now, Zephaniah 1 is talking about the judgment of God and he's talking about God and his judgment against those who have turned back from the Lord and then those who have not sought the Lord. There's two, two categories of people there. Those that knew him and was walking with him and turned back and those that have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. What was should be the inquiry? That they might do the work of the Lord. One writer in Psalm said, One thing have I desired, and that what I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord and inquire. What are you inquiring? Who I am in Him? How I must live in light of that? Remember, I told you about that indicative that in the points who we are in light of the finished work of Christ. And the imperative is what we must do in light of who we are. And those two work together. When people come to our churches and they join and they come in in faith with Christ, we help them understand their identity in Christ. We want you to know who you are in light of the finished work of Christ. You are a child of the King called with power now. And that royalty that you might live a life above sin and above reproach. Now we got to show you what you must do in light of that. And that's where the problem comes. Because nobody want to accept what has been said in light of who we are. He said, come out from among them. We want to hang out with them. So many things God has called us to in holiness. That, 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 that holiness becomes the house. It is the passion that we should pursue after. So we see the judgment of God comes against those. Uh, in Hebrews 10, the Bible said, uh, we don't look at those who have gone back. We live by faith. The just lives by faith. And he said, my soul has no pleasure. That word pleasure means I have no encouraging thoughts toward that person. And he said in verse 39, we are none of them that draw back. We're none of them that draw back, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. This whole scenario he is really talking about discipleship. Discipleship. In John 6 and uh, 26, Jesus hit it right on the head. 
He told them, he said, you seek me not because you, uh, not because you saw the miracles, because you ate and you were filled. He knew the reason by which they were seeking him. And what, are, what is your reason today? Are you seeking the Lord for a genuine reason or because he did something and you want him to do something else? Everybody has a need of some sort. But is that your main reason? Some people come to church looking for God to fix things. And if you don't fix things within a prescribed amount of time, they'll leave. They'll leave and go somewhere else or go back to where they were going. I remember one time being a part of another ministry and for a brief season, a person came because they were going through something relational wise. And they were looking for some relief. They were so hurt. They were looking for uh, God to heal a hurt and fix this situation and fix it according to their life. And when that did not happen, they did not stay. They did not stay. Many people come seeking God for what they can get. They, there needs to be authentic disciples who will follow the Lord. In 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, Verse 19, he said, they went out from us not, they were not of us. If they'd have been of us, they would no doubt have continued. Now, you got to look at that verse and understand what he's saying here. They went not out from us, but they were not of us. If they'd have been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Now, the Lord says something very probing about the wheat and the tail. He said they grow it together. He's going to be the one that's separated. And I believe in every congregation, you have some wheat and some tail. We don't know who they are, God knows. But in the process of time, by, 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 by time, it'll tell. And those that go out will go out, and you'll know for uh, their their. They're prompt to go. They're so easy to go. It's amazing how easy some can leave the church and go right back to the world. Perhaps they never left the world. They were just going to church. Perhaps they never really truly gave their heart to God. He said they went out from us because they were not of us. If they would have uh, been of us, they would have stayed. I believe Jesus, when he prayed, he said, Lord, I didn't lose any except the son of perdition. Look at John chapter 17. He said, I didn't lose any. When the Lord does a work in the heart, when he's truly allowed to do a work in the heart, it's a sustaining work. The Bible speaks of you being sealed in Christ. Now, I'm not the smartest man, but my mother used to seal stuff in a jar. And when she sealed it, she had a pantry in the back. That thing was like a gold mine because she had all these sealed preserves and okra and all kinds of stuff. She sealed it. And that stuff will last forever until you break the seal. And the last time I checked, if the Lord Jesus seals you, you're sealed. You're sealed. No one can break that seal. I don't argue with folks, but I believe if we're sealed, the only person who can break that seal is the person who seals us. I always say you can never miss what you never had. You can never miss what you never had. But I trust and pray. There were some authentic followers of Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 67. Jesus said unto the twelve, because now this crowd has been reduced. And if you want to reduce a crowd, if you want to see who's really with you or not, go to preaching the hardcore truth. Go to saying the hardcore truth. Stop exciting people. Stop, stop entertaining them and preach the truth. I saw something today that just shocked me. A uh, uh, pastor got up and said, we're going to preach about money. And he took the podium each time. He had a little podium like this and moved it off the stage. And this music started. And all of a sudden, this skit, this guy come out dressed like a dollar bill. And it was a skit. And people were just entertained for the moment about this message about money by way of a skit. And I'm thinking we've replaced the gospel with entertainment. No wonder we have big crowds. And this church was 
big old crowd up in Georgia, big old crowd, thousands of people, one of the largest churches in that area. And I see why now we got such large crowds coming now who are seeker sensitive, seeker friendly, but yet do not have the passion of the Lord. You go to preach in certain truths and they'll thin out. They'll thin out Jesus looked, he took a church from 5,000 to 12 people. Sound like the boy to have a meeting and fire that kind of pastor woman. If he's, if, if he's hired by the board, they're going to have a meeting on you. They'll fire you. Because we want to grow. We don't care about anything else. We want to grow. Jesus looks at the 12 and he asks them, will you go away? Now Peter, and y'all know a lot of people have said a lot of things about Peter. We've jumped on Peter. But we got to give him credit. Peter deserves credit. Maybe everybody else was scared to say something. I don't know. But Peter, he jumps out in front and he says, Lord, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. He gets it. He gets it. And he said, we believe. He's speaking for the crowd. The 12 that is with him. Now, Judas is a part of that. And he's, he's going to betray him. But, but he's speaking for those who have connected with the Lord by way of this 12, this, this concentrated, authentic group of people who no matter what you say, they're not leaving. And all your congregation, you have them. You have that authentic group, no matter what you preach. With this gospel, they're going to stick right with it. I've had people say, you preach too hard and walk away. I've had people say, oh, I don't like that. They don't like certain things because they up front and personal. It shouldn't be hard. It shouldn't be. And I'm not going around as a dogmatic preacher. I, I was raised in that apostolic church. You're talking about some dogma. I've heard some. I've heard preachers jump on you about what you wear. Trying to get in. I've heard preachers say you, you can't be saved unless you do this. And they got to verify you as you do this. And then they got their little list to go down. It's not by faith. Grace alone. I've been through that, so trust me, I'm no spiritual dogma when I hear it. I'll never forget, I was at a church invited to preach a revival, and uh, folks were coming, and it was great, God was moving, and this young lady showed up, and the uh, preacher uh, goes to her after the service, and uh, this was her first time there, maybe first time in church, I do not know, but I know it was her first time there. And his statement to her made me shake. He said, come back tomorrow, but put a dress on. He did not want her to come back with pants on. <coughs> he wanted her to put a dress on, and I'm thinking, why do we make such an adamant doctrine about something that is so irrelevant to salvation? She needs to hear the gospel message. God knew how to talk to her about her clothes. We, 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 we so busy trying to do the work of the Holy Spirit. It enraged me, and she didn't come back no more that week. And I thought it was disappointing that we would make an issue out of it, but, but there's some that do. They take a couple of verses, and they run with it, and next thing you know, they make dogma out of it. Peter says, where are we going to go? As to say, where else is, what else is satisfying and nourishing as you? I've not found it. Remember now, this man left his career to follow Jesus. This has happened about in the middle of the life of the ministry of Jesus. He had a short span ministry. This is about a year before he's going to die on the cross. He's in the vein of things. Peter witnessed and saw a lot. He is confident that he has found the Messiah. That's why it wasn't hard for him to leave his fishing career and recruit others. And now they've been following Jesus, stuck with him, believed in him. He's saying, where we're going to go? Where is there to go? And then many of us can feel like that. Where else is there to go? What is there to stop doing now and go back and do it? I came from a cesspool of mess, but I don't ever want to go back. What am I going to do? Go back to the trade wind bar? Go back to playing and drinking and doing the drugs? No. Jesus said, you got the words of eternal life. It was those words that draw me out of sin. And it's those words that's going to draw us into the kingdom and into the glories of heaven. And we believe and are sure that you are the Christ. Thank you, Peter. You get a bad rap. 
But he got it right. John chapter 5, and verse 24. Jesus said, He that heareth my word and believe on him that sent me have everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Now look at these statements Peter made. And I'm going to run through them real quick as he got it right. Uh, at, Caesarea, at Caesarea Philippi, in Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 17, Jesus asked the question, Who do men say that I am? Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus blessed him. He said, Lord, Lord, bless you, man. You got it right. Flesh and blood have not revealed it unto you. But my Father, which is in heaven, why? He had connected with him, being discipled and growing. He was able to take a hard saying, understand it, and give burdens to it. Remember when Jesus said, I am the Christ, then he got upset. Just in John chapter 6, where we're studying, he talked about eating flesh, and they got mad. When he said he came down from heaven, they said, who is this man to say he come down from heaven? We know who his mother is and his father. And he's right here from among us. In uh, Mark chapter 8 and verse 29, another time, uh, Peter gets it right. He said unto them, when he said, uh, because, uh, but whom say you that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the Christos, the son of the living God. Luke chapter 9 and verse 20, he gets it right. You are the Christ, the Son of God. You are the Christ. That's a reality of what he knew. He got the answer right, realizing that no one else could satisfy or compare to Jesus. I love that song that said, there's nobody like him. My mother-in-law used to sing. I love to hear those old saints sing. We sing these songs, but those old saints could sing with such an adventure. Can't nobody do me like him. Man, I love to hear my mother-in-law sing that. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. What a truth. Who is there to go to? As the psalmist said, who am I not in heaven but you? You are the strength of my life, the source. As we close in John 6 and verse 7, Jesus said unto them, Have not I chosen you twelve? One of you is the devil. He spake of Judas who would betray him, being one of the twelve. I want to make a couple of observations here. As Jesus has given them an opportunity to hear the same gospel. He's given them an opportunity to partake of living bread. They went through an extended amount of time and effort and, and, and exuberated some energy to get to Jesus. And he said, look, don't labor for that bread which perish, but that which will not perish. What can happen in your life that will cause you to turn away from Jesus? I want to ask you that question. What could happen in your life that could cause you to turn and walk away? With them, it was what he said. What could be said or done that will cause you to walk away? Or challenge you to do so. If so, if there is something that could happen in your life that will cause you to walk away, you're not growing in your faith. But as you grow in your faith, the writer says, new mercies we see, we get strengthened. We become like that tree planted. We should not be moved. We know him based on what he has done past, present, and future. We celebrate what he has done, which gives us strength to look at what we need him to do right now, knowing that he can do it even in the future. So God is a present help, past, present, and future because we know from our past what he has done and can do. We look with a greater hope to the future. In Christ we have water and bread that quenches our thirst and satisfies our hunger. I want to show you this. God has done his part. He's done his part in the work of Jesus Christ. And as he has done his part, he's looking for you to do your part. I want to read this. The great love of God brought his son to the cross. As he brought his son to the cross, 
who died, he who knew no sin, so that you and I might have life eternal. Now it's your part to do your part. You must hear the gospel. You must believe the gospel. You must repent. You must come to faith in Christ. Coming to faith in Christ. Then be baptized as a believer. Accept him and be baptized. And then be, and it says, be faithful unto death. Be faithful. God calls us to faithfulness. And I pray that you in your journey, in this walk, would allow yourself to grow. Because if you don't grow, you will find yourself challenged with a hard saying that your flesh don't want to accept. And you will walk away. But if you grow in the knowledge and the faith of God, you will find yourself, as the writer says, steadfast, unmovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. I want to pray for you. The finished work of Christ has been done. But what about your part? Have you heard the gospel? And upon hearing the gospel, did you believe? Did you really believe? If we were to stop right there and just ask how many people really believe what they've heard. And if we really believe what we've heard, why are we allowing the things and the affairs of this world to so captivate us so that we are being discorded out of our stands for Christ? If we truly believe the Lord is coming back, if we truly believe this world is not our home, if we truly believe that holiness becomes our house, then I encourage you to get in the Word of God, know the Word of God, study to show yourself approved, a work in that need of not to be ashamed, rightly divided in the Word of Truth. And as Peter said, grow, grow. I encourage you to Christian growth. Grow. You must grow. So it starts by hearing the gospel. And then you must believe. And then upon believe and repent. Repent simply means to say, God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry. Confess your faults. Confess Christ and be baptized. I want to pray for you. Maybe you've never had that opportunity to respond. Maybe you never knew the steps you needed to take to respond. That's why I love showing these things as best I can. I believe with all my heart God is raising up an army and is preparing a people. Will you be a part of that arm and allow yourself to grow in that grace? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the awesome privilege we have in you. I thank you for your word. And I thank you, Father, that as you challenge the hearts of men with your word, the truth of your word, for those who stay and remain and go on to know you, they are strengthened with might in the inner man. That's what Paul prayed. That's my prayer today, that people will be strengthened in the internet, that they might be able to stand in turbulent times. We certainly are living in some of the most drastic turbulent times that could ever be. But I thank you that you are a present help in the time of trouble. You are a sustainer to the sin sick and soul. We can come to you in faith, and you, by your grace, will heed and answer. So Father, I thank you, and I pray your grace upon every believer pray, Father, that you would bless your pastors. Father, I pray that you would show them the truth of your word, that they might declare it faithfully and truthfully to your people. And Father, I know at times difficult things are said. At times we have to look people in the eye. We have to just tell them the hard truth and just allow the truth of your word to penetrate their heart. And Father, I just pray, Lord, that there will be such a commitment to truth that we will not refrain from telling the truth and saying it in love. Father, I bless your people today. We are so thankful for your word and for your grace and your kindness to us. Go with us. Be with us. Bless your people. Father, I pray that you would strengthen them and guide them as we look for guidance, guidance, direct us. Bless your people. Bless those that are sick. Bless those that are going through. Father, every need in the lives of people, need it. Father, give us the desire to desire what you would have us to desire. That we might pray and look to you in faith. We thank you for it. We believe it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless and be upon you.
God, you've done this part. I pray you do your part. Join us next week when we start John chapter 7 as we continue our journey to the book of John. God bless you. And have this final prayer.